We're here with the one and only multi-platinum recording artist, Brantley Gilbert. How are you, sir? What's going on, brother? How you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for taking the time out of your day. Absolutely, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. You know, I, I you know, as, as we talked before, you know, I can't believe that you uh you drove from Nashville to Georgia overnight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we finished up in the studio with uh Struggle Jennings and Demon Jones about four in the morning. Uh and made the little trip home. So how far is that we, trip? Uh, it ain't bad. About five hours. Oh, see that see, I couldn't do that. I I would be I would be half asleep driving driving down. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Jesus took the wheel. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Um, so let's talk about this first, because we're 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 gonna go down memory lane, but we're gonna talk about this first. You you're you're getting ready to start your off the rails tour. Oh yeah. With Dylan Marlowe, Struggle Jennings, and Demon Jones. Yes, sir. So here's my question for you. What can or what can fans expect differently from this tour than they have the other tours? Oh man, this is stick of dynamite. Um <laughs> what we found out so year before last year, we were out with Five Finger Death Punch. Mm -hmm. Uh and last year we were out with Nickelback. Um and we built this set, man. The show is just something we were really proud of and it, it, it was something new that we did uh you know we only had a, a limited amount of time on those tours so we were able to kind of kind of condense some songs down as opposed to playing the entire song you know three and a half four and a half minutes and asking somebody to stay engaged that long uh you know we, we knocked them down to like a verse chorus and then a jam session uh we did a bunch of covers for transitions uh, just bits and pieces of them, and the show moved really well. So we really just carried that over um, for this one. So, so folks can expect, you know, seventy-five to ninety minutes of just wide open, one after another. Wow. Um, you know, and and we also found out on those tours that, you know, when we put out the announce for the Five Finger Death Punch tour and the one for Nickelback, everybody was like, "What in the world? You know, what what what, what is this about? What you know, this is." It's not a normal parent. And what we had seen is after COVID, man, uh, especially going into the Five Finger Tour, we were just noticing that, you know, people still weren't, you know, kind of ready to go back to shows. Mm -hmm. You know, there was some people that were still afraid of, you know, the COVID thing. And, and some people like me were tired of all the shit they had to go through to, to go to a show, right. you know. Um, so we wanted to offer them something different. And, you know, mixing those two genres and, and – that being said, you know, we are a little more outside the box than most country artists. And, you know, we can kind of hold our space and, and or hold our, our ground in the, the rock space. But um, what we offered folks was more of an experience than it was a show. You know, we've all been to country shows. We've all been to rock shows. But um, to have those two together, it really offered people something that, that nobody else on the road was offering them. Um, so we kind of copied and pasted that model over to this tour. Um, you know, we got Demon and, and Struggle that kind of come from the, the country rap world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Dylan's the up-and-comer that's, that's just knocking it out on tour, man. And and uh, he's got a lot of momentum building. He's got that rising star factor to him. And, um, man, it's just going to draw some unique demographics to the show. You know, expose every one of us. All four acts will see, you know, demographics we haven't seen, haven't been exposed to. Right. Um, and hopefully that kind of opens people's minds. There's a lot of folks right now that, you know, are dead set against the country rap thing. And it's like, hey, let us show us, let us show you this version. Because right. these guys, I mean, you know, there may be a rap beat to it and everything. But if you meet these guys in per person, they're every bit as country, if not more country than, than who you see in the top 10. That's, you know? that's very true. That's very true. Uh, but I, I, mean, I, I always ask a question with when people, when people, you know, seem to, you know, always says, well, that's not country. That's not country. That, what What is country today? You know, man, I I think that's that's an opinion thing. And that's, yeah. that's a personal preference thing. It's a culture thing. I think it's what you grew up being exposed to, what you like listening to. Me, personally, I listen to a little bit of everything. Yeah. You know, I, I ain't gonna lie to you, I'm, I'm a pretty big gangster rap fan myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but I listen to a little R and B. I listen to you know songwritery stuff. I listen to country, obviously old country, rock, you know, heavy metal. It just depends on what I'm doing. Um, 
and for me, man, I've, I'm, I'm a country guy. Small town life is all I've ever known. Country life is all I've ever known. I don't write songs about things I don't understand or hadn't experienced. Um, so, you know, the rules have changed these days. It's, you know, it used to be when you put out a record or an album, you know, you kind of have to put some country instrumentation on songs that might not necessarily want it, if that makes any sense. Yeah. If, if a song had a preference, it'd be like, hey, man, I want to be this. Right. And, you know, the rules have changed now to where we can, you know, kind of let songs be what they want to be. And lyrically, to me, if something's country, if 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 somebody's talking about something, I understand that's country song, you know. But but that's that's me, you know. And every, everybody's entitled to their opinion. I'm not right. sure anybody's handing out degrees on what is or what isn't country. Right, right. You know, it's like Jelly was catching a lot of junk, you know, when he when he came on the scene at first. It was like this guy's a rapper trying to do this, that, and the other. And obviously, he's been accepted now. But it took him a minute to beat down that door. And I also think that it took guys like Cole Ford and guys like me and guys like, you know, that it took us knocking on that door and being told no. Yeah. You know, I like to think that that helped, you know, but I, I, I remember people giving jelly roll shit and it was like, Hey dude, we were shooting a music video and there wasn't any running water at the place we were at. And this dude stacked, you know, he needed to, it was going to happen. I hope you don't mind me telling this story, but this dude stacks spare tires on top of each other and shit in the woods. You can't tell me that ain't country. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you, you just, you can't tell me that ain't country. It was like, you know, we were on tour with Aaron Lewis and he calls one day before show and he goes, Hey man, I'm, I'm going to be late. It was like, well, what happened? He said, well, the plane got off the runway and got stuck in the mud. I was like, dude, you, you can't tell me that ain't country. You get a private plane stuck in the mud, that's country, Bob. How does that how does that even happen? It's, it's I what guess I'm... the wind blew him off the <laughs> runway or something. And he he literally I was like, You you mean to tell me your plane is stuck in the mud? And he's yeah. He was like, wow. Okay, well, yeah, that's country. Wow. Well, that's the here's so we talked about the tour, and the tour is gonna be it sounds like it's gonna be an in your face kicking the kicking the nuts tour. Um, oh, yeah. what, what goes into picking your opening acts? Oh man, a lot. Uh, this one, I can tell you, like, as far as demon and, and struggle go, like I've, I've been a fan of that genre for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I know both of those guys personally and man, knowing who they are, it's always, it's always fun to be able to tour with your friends. You know, I learned that touring with Justin Moore and, and Cole Ford and, you know, developed a, a relationship with Toby and a friendship with Toby. Keith had got to go out with him. And, man, there's just there's something different about going out with guys that you know, you know, and you spent time around. Um, but also for, for Demon and Struggle, you know, I, I feel like coming from, from that side of things, they just haven't had exposure uh, to some of the mainstream, you know, exposure that we've had. And... I'd like to be a part of opening some of those doors for them. And I know they're bringing people to shows that, you know, if my name was the only one on the ticket, might not come. Right. You know, and I think the same for Dylan, you know, when we, when we look, you, it's not a bad thing to have somebody, you know, young and relevant that's, that's resonating at country radio and resonating to, to demographics that we, we may have not outgrown, but, we may be a little old for some of them yeah. at this point, you know? Uh, so it's good to get in front of those folks, but it's also good to get him in front of ours. And I, I think it's, you know, you look and see what, what people have going on and who you might be able to help, who might be able to help you. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, at the end of the day, for, for Struggling Demon, you know, uh, those are guys that I have personal relationships with that I want to see do good. I see them working their tails off on a daily basis, man. And and just being told no, and you know if this this helps them get their foot in the door, in in maybe some spaces that I'm familiar with, and and we've done both, you know we've we've done each other some good. Yeah, no, I I, I always I always question because it's like you know obviously you have the you have the politics in 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 every genre. It's like oh well you do this you do this you know to get someone on tour. So I've always I've always been curious about who how it happens and it's, and it's i think it's always cool to have friends like i agree it's always cool to have friends on tour cuz like one that bond becomes stronger and then Absolutely. you and you always have the support of your friends no matter what 
for sure. Uh, so let's let's talk about this because you mentioned you were in the studio last night. Yeah. <laughs> New music coming? Absolutely. Um, I finished up vocals uh, last night for the whole the whole album. So we still got a couple of people left to sing on it. We got some really cool features coming coming on this uh, this album, and we're doing a little something different on the, this tour too. So you know, I've got a song with Dylan. Mm -hmm. uh, I've also got a song with uh, Struggling Demon together. It's a song called "Me and My House," and I'm I'm really excited about it. It's a, it's a statement song, um, but it's not one that points fingers or really divides you you know by the aisle. Right. Um, it's not about left or right. It's it's just about where the way of the world's going and and kind of how we're not going that way. Right. You know what I mean. And it's it's a uh, it's it's a song that that makes a statement without without being hateful or violent or you know any of that. It's just saying, hey man, you do your thing. That's cool. That's you and your house. But but as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. You know, fly that flag out on the porch. For me and my house, we ain't raising kids. We're raising God-fearing women and men. We're wrong, still wrong, and right, still right. So heaven keep them wolves outside. Because, you know, I send them straight to your front door if they come for me and my house. Wow. So, yeah, man, it's it's stout, you know, and it's it's a statement. So I'm super excited about that. But as opposed to, you know, in the past where if we knew we were touring with somebody, we might try to get a song with them out right. for that. This... We want to be people to be able to the the folks that support us and pay for the ticket and come to the show. We wanted them to be the first ones to hear it, so we'll be playing it live, and folks will hear the live version before they'll hear the album version. So hopefully it'll get them excited about the album dropping, you know, at some point this year. But uh, for the first leg of this tour, the folks that that paid for the ticket and come see the show will be the first ones to to check them out. So are you, so what's been your writing process? Has your writing process changed over the years? Absolutely, <laughs> man. It's kind of crazy. I was talking to the demon about this the other night. He rode to Nashville with me, uh, so he was with me all you know all weekend. Um, and and we talked about how back in the day it was like you and a guitar and a little digital recorder. You know, we didn't even have audio things on our phone. You know, we had these little digital recorders that you'd hit hit the red button on. Before that, man, the first thing I recorded on was literally a tape recorder with a quarter inch, you know, that plugged in and, and had a mic cable on the other end. And I'd sing and play into one microphone on a tape. And I mean, if you mess something up, you had to start all the way over and rewind the tape <laughs> and hit record. And it was like, man, it's miserable. Nowadays, you know, you'll sit down a lot of times with a track guy, maybe two or three guys in the room, or guys and girls in the room. Um, and you leave with, you know, something that sounds closer to a cut than a work tape. Um, so these demos have kind of changed the game a little bit. Uh, it's, uh, it's been, it's, you know, it's, it's different, but I, I still will sit down by myself from time to time with a guitar and see what happens. And every now and then, you know, you get three or four guys in the room and the track guy's in there. He'll play you some stuff. If you're not feeling anything right off the bat, mm -hmm. you sit down and pick through some things. And some of those are my favorite where, where it starts with just, a guitar and a vocal, and then the track I'll build around it. Um, so it's a uh, my my process has also changed in that, as opposed to writing as many songs as I could in a year, you know, I found myself writing down cool lines in my phone and and then kind of writing songs around that one cool line, uh, you know, as opposed to now, you know, I take my time, I'm patient with it, and you know, I write thoughts down in my phone and as opposed to writing a song around one cool line i try to write a song full of cool lines wow you know it's just it's a little different these days yeah yeah i would, <laughs> I would say so <laughs> i would say so so you got okay so you got you got collaboration with dylan you got collaboration with demon and struggle any more collaborations on this new album oh yeah i can't spill the beans on all of them but, <laughs> but we got uh yeah, I, I can tell you, Justin Moore will be joining us on the song with Dylan, which is really cool. Justin's one of my long time, one of my best friends in the business, and um, there's there's a song that we got that's gonna play a, a couple different roles. Uh, we'll be playing it live too, um, but it, it's a song I'm really excited about. It's uh, it's uh, but I'm, I'm not allowed to spill the beans on it quite yet. So all right, all right. 
All right. So let's let's talk about this. I want because I I've been a fan of your career for a long time. Um, I, I've I've watched I've watched you evolve into this rocker. <laughs> and I watched you evolve into this rocker because it's like when, when I first started listening to you, it, you know, it was my my favorite song was "Picture in the Dashboard." Oh yeah, buddy. Do you still play? Because I haven't seen you since Kenny Chesney tour. Actually, maybe Tim will go on tour. <laughs> so, do you still play that song live? <laughs> Every now and then, an acoustic. If it's an acoustic show, we'll break it out. Um, man, those style of songs are some of my favorites, and we've kind of picked up more and more acoustic gigs over the last couple of years, mm -hmm. and that gives us an opportunity to play songs that we don't necessarily pull out for the the rock show, right? Um, and I think in the future. Uh, one of the things I'm looking most forward to is, is you know, we're going to have the full production rock and stuff um, on albums. But I, I think, you know, sooner than later, uh, I don't know if it's a, you know, another half to a record or, uh, you know, I've had an idea for a long time to do like B-sides, what used to be B-sides on a tape, yeah. you know, yeah. Or, a, yeah. or, or vinyl. Yeah. You know, these these B-sides will be like things that are more close to the chest for me that are torn down and acoustic. and kind of go back to that picture on the dashboard, prodigal son, uh, my kind of crazy vibe. Because uh, we kind of stepped away from that. And, um, you know, this this happens in careers, man, in, in, in the music business. You kind of get, you know, and maybe not the artist, so to speak, but maybe a lot of people around you kind of start pushing a brand. And, and right. you know, you kind of get away from, from some parts that, that you had in the beginning. So we're trying to circle back to that, man. This album um, that we're about to put out, just, just for example, is a lot, a lot less digitally automated sounds. You know, a lot, we took away a, a lot of the electric drums and went back to a band sound. Wow. Um, which is really cool. We went back to kind of the first couple records that I put out stylistically. Um, but yeah, man, I'm, I'm really, uh, the next few years, I think folks can can kind of expect us to circle back to our roots. Um, obviously, we're still gonna rock, and there's still gonna be some heavy stuff coming. Um, but we're also gonna circle back and get get some of the older vibes too. Um, what I've noticed because you know we talked about we talked about you changing changing styles or you know or or labels pushing a brand or you know not necessarily artist supports, but when did you start? Because obviously we have we, we you grow up you grow up in the industry and you're like, oh I gotta please this person I gotta please this person I gotta please this team, oh, I gotta please this radio person. When did you start to really become and and decide that you're gonna be unapologetically you? Man, like what was the um, turning point for that? Well, I'll tell you this: before I stopped drinking. That was the unfiltered version where all I all I knew to do was me, and you know it's kind of that if it ain't broke, don't fix it thing. You know, uh, <laughs> obviously with the addiction and stuff I had going on, that was broke. We fixed that. Yeah. Um, but as far as being opinionated and being me, um, man, honestly, like aside from popular belief, you know, lately we've kind of took some meat over some things, but I, I don't, I'm not necessarily politically charged when it comes to my music mm -hmm. uh very seldom do you see that pop out and uh you know part of the reason for that is because it's, it's become so divisive man that that you know i saw during covid you know coming back from covid yeah you know, i think we forgot how and i think concerts have a way shows have a way of, of reminding us like we don't have to agree on everything to have a good time together right you know what I mean? And and I'm to the point where, you know, I will say that getting married and having kids obviously changes a man. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And and since I've been a dad, I'm a more unapologetic. Like when, when there are things going on, I may take issue with something that I feel like affects my kids. Um I mean, you know, people have a problem with that, that's their business. I I, I am to the point in life, maybe I'm entering the crotchety old man phase of life early. <laughs> I'm like one person pissing me off away from screaming at people for driving too fast or something. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I, I did form opinions and felt like there, you know, there, there have been times recently when, 
you know, I've, uh, I have used my platform to take a stand for my kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I don't feel like I've, I've tried not to be, well, I don't know that I've necessarily tried not to be. I, I, I am kind of what the, what you see is what you get guy. I've right. never really tried to hide my addiction or, right. or my struggles or my imperfections, um, with anybody and, and having kids now, you know, looking back, you, you know, initially you may think, Oh, I probably shouldn't have done that. It's going to be out in the open, but, uh, man, I, I, I feel like as a dad, you know, there's nothing to be ashamed of in my past when it comes to my kids either. Cause right. I wouldn't be the dad I am. I wouldn't be the husband I am had I not been through those things. Um, and I feel like part of my job, um, as far as being a dad is, man, I'm, I'm not raising a little girl and a little boy. I'm, I'm raising not even necessarily a, 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 a little woman and, and a little man. I mean, I'm trying to raise Kings and Queens in our house. Um, we want to raise leaders. So I feel like the way the world's headed, you know, we're going to need that. Um, to, to do that, man, part of my job is, as a husband and a dad is not, you know, not just to protect and provide is it's to preside. Right. You know, and lead by example. And I, I want my kids to see me, you know, take a stand and have a backbone. And you know, I feel like that that's an important part of being a leader. If I'm going to leave my home, you know, I got to lead by example. And that's, that's been pretty tough for me, man. Cause I, I'm still getting used to domestication, dude. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I, I still pull up in the, in the parking lot to pick my kids up from school, like playing music that I probably shouldn't, especially <laughs> since the school's out of church. But you know, I, I mean, I still got subs in my truck, man. The young me is still very much alive and well. Yeah, <laughs> we try, you know, it, it's a it, it's a delicate balance, man. But I, I do feel like, you know, there's there's a lot of people in the business now that live in selfie mode, right? You know, and it's it's a lot of it's geared towards social media, and and to be the husband and the dad I want to be, I found that that was that was kind of hindering that process, man. Um, so I kind of slowed down on that. I'm really concentrating on my house and my wife got me back in church and buddy, that'll, that'll throw a stick in the spokes on some stuff. Have you think you're there for two? So, um, there's a little transition going on, man. And, and, uh, I, I'm, I'm excited about what the rest of my life looks like, especially with those two little angels in it, man. Um, it's, you know, so that it's crazy. You, you mentioned, you mentioned the, you know, the political world and the politics and I, I I've come to realize, and I, I think I said the same thing. I said the same thing, you know, a couple of days ago on my Instagram story, I said, I wish we can all go back to the time where we didn't talk politics or beliefs and all, and we just respected one another's. We didn't, we didn't really, we didn't, like, it was one, it was times where like, we didn't care what you think. We didn't care about, you know, who you voted for, who, or what belief you had, we were respectful to each other and we became friends and we listened about whatever was going on in their lives. It was nothing ever political. Um, do you think, do you think that politics has kind of taken over uh, the country music world? I think it's, it's creeping in. Yeah. Right. Um, I gotta say this, man, most of the people that, that I love and respect their opinion um, probably reside more towards the middle of the aisle than even they might like to admit. Yeah. I think all of us do. I think there's a couple of deciding, you know, dividing factors that send us one way or the other. Like me personally, damn, if, if the Democrats would give me my guns and the Republicans would give me my pot, I'd be all right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but no, you know what I think more than anything, man, is, is we're kind of losing the ability to have conversations. I think back in the day, you'd have a conversation and it'd be political without you knowing, but it was okay to have a different opinion because mm. we still had the ability to have a conversation. There aren't many conversations going on because most of the conversations going on or the communication going on right now is on social media. People are hiding behind screens. You don't have to necessarily be held accountable for that. Nobody gets punched in the face anymore. <laughs> Anybody can say what they want, which is cool. That's, you know, or one of the, you know, the two major things that I, two of the major things that I think separates our freedom from the rest of the world's freedom, you know, is, is the first amendment and the second, Yeah, you know, and, and that first amendment is 
you know, important to me. And I, I feel like it's important to everybody. And it's important for me to understand it. You know, that there are opposing views and, and opinions to mine and I'm okay with that. Um, but I, I enjoy, or I do, I miss, let's say that, that personal interaction, that face-to-face -face interaction where, you know, there, there's a lot of respect there when, when you're face-to-face -face with somebody like you and I talking right now, we're, we're obviously over a phone, but I can still see your face. Like, you know, we can communicate, right. You know, and have a conversation and, and agree to disagree on stuff. You know, right. I feel like we're losing the ability to do that. Everything's so charged now that the minute that, you know, these, these triggers and everything else, the minute somebody says something you disagree with, we're up in arms and we're ready to set the other person on fire. Man. It's like, <laughs> hey, dude, we don't have to agree on everything. You know, at the end of the day, we're all guys' children. And, and you know, I, I, I hope we, I hope at some point, you know, we, we kind of hit a dead end in that space and realize that we're, we're more alike than, than we are different in a lot of ways and, and regain that ability to have a conversation. Yeah. 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 I, I hope that day returns. I hope I really do. I hope that day returns. Um, so speaking of being unapologetically you with Brantley Gilbert here, um, how it, you've had such a successful career, you're, you're multi-platinum, you're sun out arenas. How important is it for you to have number one hits? You know, that, that importance has, uh, man, I'll be honest. It's, it's kind of lost a little bit of his flair. Mm -hmm. You know, number ones are awesome. Mm -hmm. Awards are cool. Uh, but you know, in, in the, the climate we're in right now, uh, I don't know if a song's going to work at radio or not. I don't know what radio wants from me. Right. You know, the best thing I do is put my best foot forward and and write songs that mean something to me that I dig, and and hope other people do too. But if they don't, man, at least I'm I'm sitting there at the end of the day that I can stand behind what I put out. Right. You know what I mean. You may release a song, and and, and two, I think there's there's chapters of your career that you go through, and I I, I feel like it was. One of the mistakes that I've made in my career, looking back, man, I did, I've been doing this full time since I was 19. So that's 20 years. Um, you know, and looking back at my career, there were times when I chased hits, right? More, more so than I do now. It was, you know, I'd sit down and be like, all right, we're going to write us a number one today. And I, I feel like you can hear that on my albums. You can hear that on, on, you know, our singles and what we've sent to radio. A lot of times what's been sent to radio has been my least, the label hates it when I say this. A lot of things that we've sent to radio have been my least favorite song on the project, you know. Really? Um, yeah, in in the spirit of chasing a hit and chasing what what you think is going to work at radio, as opposed to now, we're, we're I've been able to kind of transition more into, hey man, we're going to put this song out and shine a spotlight on it because it means something to me and it might change something, you know. Or we're going to put this song out because, you know, off the rails it's coming out Friday. We're releasing that song because we're going to play it on tour. It's the opening song in the set. Um, and we kind of want to set the tone for what the tour is going to be. Um, but outside of that, you know, the songs that we want to put a spotlight on or that I want to put a spotlight on personally are songs that, that might, you know, change something. They might motivate you. They might, you know, might kind of promote you to make some changes and, and you know, or, or might hit you closer to home. They might punch you in the chest a little bit. I, 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 uh, I compare you to, and this is a compliment, so I don't want, I don't want anyone who's listening to be like, oh, he's not <laughs> enough compliment. I compare you to Eric Church. I have like, a lot of respect for Church. Yeah, like a many Eric, like a min, like I wouldn't say many, but like just a secondary Eric Church, like a, like a little brother Eric Church, because it's like, because <laughs> <laughs> it's like. You have like you guys have you have this mentality where it's all about the music. Mm -hmm. It's all about the quality of music you put out. You don't care about hits, you don't care about the awards. You, like you'll put one one song out that like you said, shine a spotlight on to go to radio or if, if radio likes it, who care who cares? Kind of thing. Yeah. And this is not a this is not a dig towards radio people. Um 
<laughs> <laughs> but it's like if Radio likes it, cool. If Radio doesn't doesn't like it, oh well. The song means a lot, and it's the quality of music you release. And I feel like I wish a lot of artists would do that and would have that mindset because I feel like we get stuck. I feel like artists get stuck in this branding and in this gimmick because that's what the label's pushing. Right. And that, dude, I think a lot of artists want to do that. Yeah. Uh, and it, man, it took me a while in my career. I mean, I feel like you have to pay dues to a certain extent to be able to do that. You know what I mean? You kind of have to earn your stripes before you, before you bark orders type thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? You have to come to the table. You have to have bargaining power and you have to have leverage to be able to, you know, to kind of be able to influence the decisions that are being made. Yeah. In the offices. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's something I feel like, you know, to a certain extent, it used to be something you had to earn. Nowadays, I, I feel like what's, you know, the, uh, a lot of these kids are coming from, from social media, coming from TikTok, or coming from YouTube, and you know, and in the old days, uh, the old days, <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, I ain't great for nothing, bro. Let that, let that one sit. Let that one sit in for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe I just said that out loud. I'm gonna go sit on my 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 rocking chair in a minute and yell at people for driving too fast by my house. Um, but you know, we, we came up the old school way, man. Where where you go to a town and you know, you, you play the smallest room there till you can't fit in it anymore. Mm -hmm. And then you go to the next size room, the next size room, the next size room till you get to an arena, you know, and God willing. Um, nowadays, that's that's a little bit different. The guys that are, and girls that are doing that are few and far between. Uh, but I feel like it, it was a blessing for us because we were able to come to the table with some bargaining power. Mm -hmm. You know, we're able to come to the table and say, hey, you know, I'm not, asking you to to make me something we, we've brought a a working business model to the table mm -hmm. you know we have a brand that works um and i, I do think that's one thing that, that social media is helping it, it, you know a lot of these artists yes i call it living in self selfie mode but they're putting themselves out there man and they're kind of developing who they are as an artist before they come in the room and sit down at the table and, you know, I think that's a way of, of kind of creating your own leverage, if that makes any sense. No, I think it, I think it is. I think, I think with social, like the social media is the smaller room. For of. sure. It's, it's, a, it's a smaller room before you get to the bigger room. Um, you know, I, I always, I always said when labels were during COVID, when labels were signing the guys off of TikTok and things like that, it's like, I'm all, I've always was curious the, as to how it was going to end up because of the fact that it, you can't really put asses in the seats. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the touring side is is where that business model falls on its face. And here, here's why, right? Yeah. Like, and it's it's almost unfair to them, man. Learning, you know, coming from the world I came from, I over for a guy named Corey Smith for years. Uh, in college, Marks Corey's a beast, man. For those of you who don't know who Corey is, he's from the same hometown I'm from. He's between him and Skinner, they were the the two, you know, acts that showed me that it was cool to write about home. Mm -hmm. It was cool to write about things that, you know, really specific to home too. Um, and what I found through the years is is like the songs that you write that you think are are not as relatable or broad in in subject matter, the things that you would think would be more commercial. Um, are not necessarily so. The things that are closer to the chest are the things that resonate with people. I, th I think they feel that. Right. You know, we, I think for a long time, and and I'm, I made this mistake in my career, you know, you may dumb stuff down, make it simple and cookie cutter and catchy. You say, oh, that's what everybody's going to like. It's a no-brainer. And then, you know, we've, we've seen it. It's on paper. You you can look that that's not the case when it comes to us. You know, it, it, you, you guys, you listeners can hear that stuff. You see yeah. through it now, you hear it, you know, it's, it's, you know, you know, authenticity from, from cookie cutter and, uh, you know, it's our job to make sure we bring something to the table that, you know, resonates with us. Right. But I do feel like, you know, when I opened for Corey, it was just me and a guitar until, you know, we got to the point where he brought a guitar player out. So I was able to bring a guitar player out, but it was never a full band when I opened for him. 
And, you know, I learned a lot from that situation, man. When it's just you and a guitar on that stage and there's, there's a thousand people in there, you know, you have to learn how to communicate. You have to learn how to read a crowd. Um, you have to learn how to play to them. You know, you don't necessarily get that on social media. You may learn how to communicate with your demographic, but when you get into a room where people are relying on you to entertain them, you know, if you don't have any experience with that, dude, you're throwing these kids to the wolves. Correct. You know what I'm saying? Like, as opposed to us, we're, you know, coming up before I signed a deal, man, that we, we had ourselves in a position where we were able to get in some support roles mm -hmm. for some A, B list artists. Man, it taught us a lot about touring. You know, I, I learned at a granular level how to communicate with people. And I, I learned that from touring with people and from personal experience. And, and like I said, when, when you don't have that, when you don't bring that to the table, man, it's 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 not – every crowd's a tough crowd. Yeah. You know what I mean? It may be 10 people. That, 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 a lot of times, that's the hardest room to play to. You know, and when you, when you don't have that experience coming to the table, these, these – you know, some of these kids get a song out that works on, on TikTok, and you throw that kid a bus, you know, and, and a lot of these labels will do this. You sign this kid – you know, throw some money in his pocket, put him on a bus and put him out in front of several thousand people. They're not telling you, you got to pay for that bus and the money they put in your pocket is recoupable. Yeah. <laughs> you had to pay it back. <laughs> yeah. It's not some interest free loan, bro. Where it's like, Hey, here's the free money. It's like, no, you're, this is like college debt, bro. We're, yeah, we're yeah. handing you something. You gotta, you gotta pay it back. <laughs> yeah. There's money in your pocket, but you're in ours. You know what I mean? Like, oh man. That's, but that's it's uh, great I do think you know a lot of times when we're able to get some of those up and comers out with us, you know I take pride in not just my band and but I take pride in my crew, man. My, you know my guys, you know showing other teams, you know the best of of the best and worst we've seen. You know what I mean? Because you go out on tours and be treated well, and you you go out on tours where you're treated awesome and. And you learn how to treat other people on tour too. And and touring to me is one of the most important aspects outside of the music of your business is is your performance. And yeah. you know, when that's live and it's in front of people, dude, it's, that's no joke. You get in front of ten thousand people and say the wrong thing. You know, don't communicate well, you come off like an asshole. You know, that's ten thousand people that are not coming back. Yeah. You know what I mean? it, it, it takes it takes one word one wrong wording of something <laughs> I mean, they turn quick dude especially a new one i remember being on tour with kenny chesney and dude, by the end of it we, we kind of figured it out but you know coming in and we're playing stadiums and you know uh we don't have a stadiums where the fans there Right. You know, a lot of those are Kenny Chesney fans. A lot of those are your Jimmy Buffett, like, put your arms around each other, sing Kumbaya. Right. And we're coming right. out and hitting their face and cussing <laughs> and shooting birds. And it's like, you, know, you see a lot of people sitting back in their seat like, this is not what I signed up for, man. I told my wife we was going out for a nice little country show and what in the hell is this? You know? <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, you learn how to communicate and, and read the room and, and that's a, that's a huge part of my job. When I'm on stage, and you see me looking around, and I'm smiling, I'm pointing at people. I'm partying, and I'm looking at you, and I'm smiling, but I'm also watching you. I'm, I'm you know, kind of reading your body language. I'm looking at different sections of the crowd, who's into it, who's not. Because you know, a lot of times, if you lose the back of the room, right, that's usually important because the people in front of them are hearing the noise behind them. That noise stops. You know, they get quieter. Right. So you have to entertain the entire crowd, you know, and, you know, if it's a, if it's a bar, it's pretty easy. You can see all of them. Right. You know, you, you get in the stadiums, you're talking to people you can't see, you know, so there's just a lot of aspects of the show that, man, when I was drinking, I never thought about any of that stuff. I remember, man, when I got, uh, when I was, when I was getting sober, Keith Urban showed up to the rehab facility I was in. And this is, this is some raw information for you. This story, you know, I've told it a, a bunch of times, but I, I remember one of the things he said, he asked me, he said, what are you scared of? And, you know, I was, I was probably seven or eight days into getting sober. So man, I'm detoxing hard. I'm withdrawing hard, but 
I'm still trying to stick to my guns and be the tough guy. You know, I, was, I ain't scared of nothing. And I remember looking at me dead in the eyes and being like, what are you afraid of? And man, it was one of those moments where I realized I was talking to a like-minded person, somebody that had been through a similar situation. And right. dude, it was kind of a vulnerable moment. And he met me where I was at. And I, I told him the truth. I was like, man, I'm terrified to do my job. I don't remember what it's like to do it sober. You know, for, for these years, you know, part of the reason I drank, you know, and there were several, but part of the reason I drank is we're playing shows on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays in college towns. They've been waiting a month for you to get there. They're partying. You know, you kind of had, I thought, thought I had to drink to get on their level to be able to party with them. That's not necessarily the case. I remember him telling me, he was like, man, you're going to feel butt naked up there for a minute. It's going to be miserable. It's going to suck. He said, but when you wrap your mind around it, he said, you're going to be better at your job because you're going to read the room better. You're going to be more in control of your words and your actions. And, and man, he was right. I, I remember, man, I literally left rehab, went, got on the bus, went to a doctor's office, left there, got on the bus, and went straight on the Eric Church Blood, Sweat, and Beers tour. And, man, I'm talking about you're, you're looking at anywhere from ten to 20,000 people a night. Right feeling like the only thing between me and them and me being butt naked was my guitar and, and man, it was miserable. Oh my God. It was terrifying. Um, but I, you know, I, I had to figure out how to work through it. And you know, that was, that was an important part was, you know, a vet kind of coming to the table, somebody been there and, and just telling me like, Hey man, it's going to suck at first, but you're going to have more control over what you say and do and how you read the crowd. And that's, that's the truth. And I didn't realize how, how big of a part of my job that was until I was sober and I was able to, to kind of soak all that in and go, Hey man, you know, if there's an area of the crowd that's not necessarily feeling you jumping all over the place and being in their face, you got to take notice. Not that you change your entire show, but you've made it cater to them different. Right. You know what I mean? It's just taught me how to read a room. Do you, do you, here, here's, here's a question for you. Cause you, you, you brought up when you were with Corey Smith and you did nothing but you and the guitar. Do you miss those days? We call them the good old days every now and then. <laughs> the, those days and the days, man, when it was a band and you had to push all your own equipment in. Dude, for a long time, we had nine people in a Ford excursion. And my grand entrance to the venue was open. They'd, they'd get out of the truck and open the back hatch. And I stayed in the back on a folded up futon mattress. I'd have to climb out of the back glass onto the tongue of the trailer. And then unload all my equipment and then play a show in front of God and everybody. And it was like, man, like at that point, there's no shame. Cause it's like, it, that, right. it don't get more embarrassing than that. Man, that <laughs> truck barely made it here. Guys, just be glad that we're here. We'll be inside in a minute. I'll change clothes, <laughs> you know, but, but yeah, man, it honestly, looking back at those days, man, um, you know, and, and please don't get me wrong, because I know that it's, it's a God thing for us to be where we're at. I surrounded myself with some some incredible men and women that, that, that helped me build this thing over the last 20 years. And, and I'm so proud of where we're at um, and, and where we got to. Uh, but that being said, looking back, yeah, man, the, the unfiltered college crowd is just bouncing off the rafters. You get this euphoric feeling where... You're just 10 foot tall and bulletproof and, you know, you're doing things that you probably shouldn't and don't give a shit. And it, yeah, I mean, there was, there was a lot to love about those days that in the moment it may seem like it sucks, but looking back, it's either funny or it's awesome you know, <laughs> or both. <laughs> yeah. I, I always, I always ask people, you know, artists, it's like, the, once you get to a certain level, do you ever just want to go? Like, do you do you do you see in the future of you doing an acoustic tour? We've talked about that several times, and I, I do think I do think the future holds that for us. I think when we uh, when we start doing you know the B side idea I was telling right. you about, um, there's a there's a few different models that we've looked at, a few different scenarios. Um, but yeah, I think that's man, that was always an important part of my music, an important an important part of my career. Uh, not that we necessarily bailed on it. We just, man, we, we, we were chasing what was working. Um, and now at this chapter in my life, man, that's something that I really enjoyed and something that I miss. So yeah, we're going to circle back to it. Yeah. I, I, I can see it now. And this is my vision is like, you know, you and two other artists 
just sitting around having a, having a writer literally in the middle of the arena having a writer's round kind of going back and forth for two hours three hours at a time of all your hits and just one acoustic i think that'll be a really i think if you can do that that'd be like a really cool experience you talk about experiences that that would be a cool experience well it's always cool you know we do uh the most recent one i did a a buddy of mine does uh, a charity event in his, his hometown for suicide awareness. And um, we went up and played it. And, and man, I was sharing the stage with some of the best writers in town. It, that was really cool. Cause you, you, you're listening to the guy that, you know, Taylor Phillips gets up there. You listen to the guy that wrote hurricane for Luke Holmes and yeah. tons of song for, for tons of other artists. And, and you get to hear the story behind the, the songs and while they were originally written, and there, there's power there, man. It's it's a real cool situation, and it's humbling too, because man, a lot of the guys you see on your TV screen and picking up the awards, you know, when you see the guy behind the scenes and hear him sing it, it's different. Yeah, it's, it's different. Yeah, I got. I heard. I heard. A, I heard a a demo of Kenny Chesney's current current single, um, "Take Her Home," and Hardy wrote it. So Hardy is on the demo. And I'm just like sitting here, like, you know, I see why Kenny took it, but also it's like, why did Hardy give that song up? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not making the mistake that I made early in my career. And that was, man, I was a song hoarder. I'd have guys hit me up and be like, hey, man, you got a song in this vein? And in the back of my mind, I'm like, yeah, I got 10 of them, but what if I need them? <laughs> you know? Okay, so here's my question. Cause you really, here's my question. You, you, you just called yourself a song holder, but you, after after recording it yourself, you gave up Dirt Road Anthem and you gave up My Kind of Party. Yeah. What 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 was the what was the thinking behind it? If you were such a song holder, what was the thinking behind that? Well, so I don't like to say I gave them away. I shared them. Here's okay. my thing, man. So my kind of party, I wrote when I was 17 years old. I started it in the back of an insulation blow truck. It took me some years to finish it, uh, to get it where I wanted it. Uh but I put that out on the record and my version of that will always exist. Right. right? Um, same thing with Dirt Road Anthem. What's crazy about that dude, is, is two days ago, I just got to play the original that was just me and a guitar and me and Colt's voice um, is gold now. Wow. <laughs> the, our version of that song is gold. The version that I put out on my record went gold a while back. Um, so those songs exist in, in the form that we did them in. Right. It, it, it wasn't like once Aldine did it, I had to pull those songs off. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like they'll always be mine, but I, I shared them. And, man, they opened up doors for, for guys like me and Colt and a lot of other artists in this this genre. You know, I remember, I, I won't say what label it was, but right before that, uh, we were kind of in negotiations with a label. Mm -hmm. And came to Dirt Road Anthem. They wanted me to release that as my first single, and I was—I didn't like the idea of it. And I know this sounds crazy, um, but I wasn't a country rap guy. You know that was Colt's thing. Now, the reason I, you know, I had bits and pieces of that song written. Um, and there was a reason I didn't put it out by myself. Colt had, you know, came to the table, and you know what he wrote on it made it freaking huge difference right um but i wasn't that guy you know they they you know this label didn't want call on the song they wanted me to do it by myself and kind of had an issue with that um kind of had an issue with the fact that they didn't want my band to play on it they wanted higher guns at the time and which is it, it's a thing and i know why now at this stage of my career i understand right um you know there's session guys you can bring your band in and it's cool you get a different sound um, but when you look at it, you know, some of these A-list guys that, that they're just a different breed. They're in the studio every day. They play different. They save you time. They save you a shit ton of money. Um, but I remember that, that label wanted me to put, and it was really non-negotiable and I passed on the deal because of that. Um, just because I didn't, I mean, what do I follow that with? Right. I didn't have another dirt road anthem in my back pocket. You know, but when Aldine brings it to the table, he's he's a fully established dude that's been outside the box. It's kind of he's got the bad boy thing going on. He's a Georgia boy. We knew he'd re represent it well. 
Right. And in the back, you know, not in the back of my mind, you know, I remember Colt Collaby and telling me that he was interested in Dirt Road Anthem and that he was interested in my kind of party too. And Michael Knox, Outings Producers, is a good friend of mine. And, uh, man, I remember getting excited because it was like, you know, dude, those those songs, my version of those already exists. Colt right. and I's version of Dirt Road Anthem already exists. We're not giving anything away. You know what I mean? We're sharing it. And, and it's going to, I mean, not only monetarily, I mean, it changed things for me financially, but, man, that opened a lot of doors for my career as an artist, not just a writer. Yeah. Um, but it helped me as a writer as well. It gave me credibility in some of these rooms, and it got me in, in some of the rooms uh, with some of these, these writers that, that, without it, probably wouldn't have taken the time to get in a room with me. Right. You know, so, dude, it was that was a blessing in a million different ways. And I remember I had to put out a YouTube video at one point during that because, you know, a lot of our fans were like, man, what did you, what, why'd you sell your songs? Like, man, I didn't share it. I didn't give it away. Jason Aldean didn't put on a black ski mask and come in my house and steal it. You know, <laughs> you know th this did some good for me in a million different ways. And for all of us, really, because... You know, you look at Dirt Road Anthem, without Dirt Road Anthem, man, I think there's a lot of songs in our genre that we would have missed out on. Right. You know, that song opened the door for, for a lot of stuff that's outside of the box. Yeah, I think I think that it's, I think Dirt Road Anthem, I call Dirt Road Anthem the, the second coming of the Tim McGraw and Nelly over and over again. Yeah, there you go. Because that kind of, that I feel like without, without over and over again, you wouldn't have had the Dirt Road Anthem being played on radio. Yeah. And then you wouldn't have you wouldn't have FGL with Nelly or, or Cruz get played on the radio. So it's like I, I feel like that's the second that was the second coming, and that was like the that was the door that the second door. Like you get you get through the you go through like a house and you have the first door, and the first door was kicked down by Tim McGraw and Nelly, and then you got Brantley Gilbert and Cole Ford hit the second door and it just busted down, and now you're in. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, Al Dean comes in and builds the house. You yeah, know what I mean? correct. <laughs> We're just gonna rebuild the house. You know what I'm saying? Correct. Thanks for opening the door, guys. To watch this yet? Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Let me renovate it a little bit. Let me renovate it for yeah. you. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm gonna multiply it by about a hundred million. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, dude, I, I do. Th you're exactly right. And I think there's some things coming on stylistic. I try to remember that when new stuff comes out on the radio. It may not be my cup of tea, but hey, man. Uh, you know, I ain't got to like everything. And right. it may open a door for us to have the road. Right. But you got to also remember, you weren't someone's cup of tea at some point in time. I'm not a lot of people's cup of tea to this day. And that's <laughs> all right. I'm an asshole, depending on who you talk to. I don't feel like that's the case. I feel like I'm a pretty nice guy. But there are people out there that run it. You know, we're not allowed to have bad days. There may have been somebody come up to me at Walmart when I was on the phone with my wife trying to you know, wander around in a wet paper sack, not knowing what the hell, you know, where anything is in Walmart. And somebody come up where I'm trying to figure that out, be like, hey, man, can I get a, you know, and I might have said, hold on a minute, the wrong way. But for the rest of their life, every crowd they're in, when my name comes up, oh, that guy's a dick. <laughs> you know, I will forever be a dick in that guy's eyes. And that, that sucks, you know, but it, it's kind of part of it. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, you know, again, that comes with just being a human being. You know, that's why I started the podcast. The podcast was basically to show, to show people, the human side of artists, and they're not just products. They're not just, you know, a brand. They're they are human beings. Um, I would be remiss to ask you, because I know what he meant to me. But what did Toby Keith mean to you? Oh man. Uh... Those are boots that'll never be filled, my friend. There was only one of that guy. That won't ever happen again. You'll never have that guy again. Um, because he was the OG, you know, to me, of, of a lot of different things. Yeah, he took some pages out of the Cash book and the Whalen book and, you know, as far as having a backbone of being outside the box. But you're talking about a guy that could could – do red solo cup and then follow it with a patriotic anthem that just <laughs> floored everybody and then release a love ballad that was like i mean what the hell is this dude doing man he's gonna pull on my heartstrings he's gonna want to make me beat up a terrorist and then he's gonna you know he's gonna make me laugh what is that about uh, and i tell you by the end of it man i had to, to 
the God given our, our blessing of, of being able to have a friendship with Toby. There was never one time, dude, when I when I texted or called Toby that I didn't hear back within 24 hours. Like he was it, it kind of became for me, you know, he's already somebody I looked up to and uh, you know, he was just a, a huge influence on me and my passion for for working with the military. A lot of that, a lot of that came from you know some of my friends going, you know, to Afghanistan or Iraq and coming back different men. And some of them not, and you know, a lot of times not in the best way. Right. Um, but a lot of it came from watching Toby and listening to Toby and having conversations about, hey man, like these guys and girls are are making sacrifices that we didn't. Like we're out here playing for thousands of people because there are guys and girls over there fighting thousands of people, right? And dodging thousands of bullets, right? You know, and, and you know when it when it came to you know the military veterans, you know first responders, like Toby gave those people a voice. You know what I mean? And and he he, he shared spotlight with them, and and that showed me. I remember looking, man. My goal in the music business was to sell out the Georgia Theater, uh, and we did that really early. And then things kind of took off with us, and I wasn't necessarily ready. And and I was never that dude that prayed for that kind of spotlight. I, when Corey Smith quit his job as a teacher and went to doing music full time, I remember going. I, I never thought that was a thing. I thought you had to go to town to sign a deal to be able to do that. Right. And when he did that, I remember going, man, like if I could do that, and not have to blow insulation and put it in cabinets and maybe do a little dirt. You know, it, that was that was a huge thing for me. And that, that was my goal, man, was to, right. man, if I could do this full time and make ends meet playing music, like who wouldn't want to do that? I had no idea it turned into what it did. You know what I mean? And God gave me a whole lot more spotlight, a whole lot more platform than I ever prayed for and knew what to do with. You know, it's, it's guys like Toby that kind of shine some light on, on options that make a difference. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? He, he totally could have took every inch of spotlight that he had and progressed in his career and made it count for him and him only. Or he can do what he did and share it with, with righteous causes, man, and with, with righteous people that deserve that attention and deserve that awareness. And and it, Toby was a voice for so, so many people. Um, but, man, I, I'll tell you this, too. Like, he was a good sounding board for me, and he, he almost a, a big brother in some ways. See, he was, you know, I was a little... You know, I took some pages out of his book, but just by nature, I was that guy. Right. You know, if, if somebody tells me not to do something, it's probably going to happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> the minute you tell me not to do something, I was one of those people that knew early on, like, I just wasn't meant to have a boss. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it just wasn't in the cards for me. Yeah. And so Toby had a lot of solid advice for me, but I'll tell you this, the last conversation we had um, was a few weeks before he, he died. And it, it, it had nothing to do with music. Um, it was about parenting. I, I remember kind of just reaching out and telling him I was thinking about him, praying for him. And, and he hit me back like, what are you up to? You know, and, and I was watching my kids ride around the farm on four wheelers and my six year old acting like a slap fool. And I sent him a video of that. And he said, yeah, that one's going to be all right. And then I said, it ain't that one I'm worried about. It's the four year old little girl that has Al Capone living inside her, you know, um, uh, She's a gangster, dude. She will run a criminal organization in middle school without a doubt. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Toby had some advice for me on parents, and I won't, I won't share all that, but, dude, he, he was really like, he just became a friend to me. And, and uh, I can't tell you how many people I've had that conversation with that had the exact same experience. And looking back on it now, it's like, dude, how did you, how did you find the time to be a husband and a father and, and a role model and a friend and a big brother, you know, figure to so many of us. Yeah. There's not enough time in the day for that. How do you do that? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's God, God didn't make but one of those, man. And I miss him till the day I die. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one more question for you. Um, what is your greatest accomplishment? Oh, man. My four-year-old little queen and my six-year-old little king. Kate, on a better note. Kate, Kate, on a better note. That's, no. <laughs> that's that smile right there. That's you knew the answer right, right when I started saying you knew the answer. That smile, I just got chills. 
That's well, not- <laughs> and I got to say, I wouldn't have them without, you know, dude, God bless me with an incredible woman. Um, this, I couldn't ask for a better mom for my kids. And I'll tell you this, dude, somebody asked me a VIP thing the other day. It was kind of embarrassing because uh, it's always been a quick answer and, and almost muscle memory. But, you know, somebody asked me what I wanted to be remembered for. And once I got past the initial sting of, damn, am I out of that part in my career? My beard's gotten gray enough that people are asking me, you know, what I want people to think when I die, you know? Once I got past that, it was like, man, I literally sat there for, it had to be a couple minutes. And I remember racking my brain and kind of fighting the instinct to go with that muscle memory answer. It's just, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of a cop out, you know, what you want to hear answer. And for for whatever reason, man, I just wanted to be honest. And and to be completely honest, I was drawing a blank on a musical answer. Like I was trying to think of something that had something to do with music, something to do with my career. And I told him, I said, you know, and I, I, I stand by it. It's like, you know, a lot of you will probably hate this answer. The honest to God truth is it doesn't make a damn what any of y'all think. You know, it doesn't, I don't, I don't, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what this record label guy thinks or this, this management company thinks or this, these fans think if, if my wife and my kids think something different then I have failed, you know, as a man, as a human being. Yeah. And uh, I'm not going to do that. So, yeah, man, I guess I want to be remembered as a good husband and a good father. And, I mean, I come in late last night and didn't, uh, I kind of missed some opportunities. So my wife might vote not in favor of that today. But, you know, we all, <laughs> we all trip and make mistakes, man. And I understand that I'm not perfect. But at, at the end of the day, I hope I, I get it close enough to where my, my wife, you know, says, man, you know, he was a good husband. And my kids say, man, he was a good dad. He was a good leader. And, you know, do my job to protect, provide, and preside over my household. And then when the good Lord calls me home, maybe he'll let me hang out for a little while, at least long enough to see them. I hope I beat <laughs> them there, you know. Uh, maybe at least let me hold the door for him before he kicks my ass out, you know. Yeah. We'll try to hang for a minute. Wow. Wow. That's, 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 that is, that is an answer. That is a powerful answer right there. A powerful <laughs> answer. I want to thank you for taking your time out your day today. Seriously. Oh man. Thank you, brother. I enjoyed the hell out of this. Yeah, so did I. <laughs> so did I. So did I. We got to do it again soon. So I'm in buddy. This has been another one with Brantley Gilbert.